discussion that we had today was about agriculture as a solution to climate change. And we um, firmly believe that agriculture has been a little often discussed subject and that in fact it needs to become a central aspect of any kind of uh, serious solution to climate change, both as a mitigation factor and as an adapt adaptation solution as well. So one of the things um, that I think we all realize as we're coming here to Copenhagen is, even though the, the negotiations aren't officially over yet, we know that it is a spectacular failure. And it's a failure of governments and also to some extent even some of the NGOs who have been working on this for the past decade. And one of the reasons I think at the heart of, you know, I, I can talk about some of the details of why we have stalled negotiations and such, but at the central framing reason is there is a real um, central failure of governments and as I said also some of the NGO um, constituencies to really realize and respond people's everyday lives and aspirations and what are their issues on the ground. And we are saying that agriculture of course starts on the ground and that is a very central motif to everybody's life and our food systems. And instead of beginning climate negotiations with the assumptions that all of our fixes or that even our major fixes have to be expensive, huge technological infrastructure solutions, some of which are still even unproven solutions, that um, we can start with more low cost, low tech, if you will, knowledge based solutions and have immense uh, and rapid response in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And a few of the statistics, for example, is that, first of all, industrial agriculture is 13.5 percent at a minimum of all global industrial uh, greenhouse gas emissions. When you add on the energy backpack, that is the pesticide production, the transport of food, we've estimated it could be anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions. That's an astonishing figure and to us it's really stunning that our government leaders both on domestic levels and in these international talks have not been addressing this and it's just not part of the equation or in a very minimal way. Um, of that figure, 60% of total nitrous oxide emissions, which is the most potent greenhouse gas, is due to industrial agriculture and more specifically to the use of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. We could convert tomorrow and not use synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. We know what fertilizers fertilizers we need that are natural, that we could reduce our nitrous oxide emissions greatly. Again, it's the most potent greenhouse gas. Another exciting uh, reason that agriculture uh, regenerative or ecological agriculture systems could be a great solution. 50% of all methane emissions, uh, global emissions, are due to industrial agriculture. A large part of that is due to the way we raise cattle, uh, pigs, chicken in these concentrated feedlot operations. We could get rid of those for many reasons we need to anyway, but um, they do tremendous environmental damage. But that is another way that we could re-look at how we're raising our livestock and, and that we could move toward a more humane, ecological way and reduce emissions that way too. A better way or a, a a good way to use fertilizer instead of using synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, which is chemical fertilizer, you can use manures, for example, readily available, especially on farms that are very integrated and have multifunctional capabilities. Manures can be used, nitrogen fixing crops can be used, better rotation of fields, letting fields go fallow for longer. These are not expensive alternative solutions, and they also produce, they don't uh, inhibit yields at all and in fact many studies show I mean I think we all know now that too many use of chemicals has dec has declined yields of almost every crop that we have but if we have the alternative methods of non-chemical farming the yields are as high or higher than even our conventional crops are so I think one of the reasons we're very excited and feel very confident that uh, ecological agriculture could be and should be a central solution to climate change is, for example, so many of the studies that have been done recently. Rodale Institute has done a 20 and 10 year study. It's shown that, for example, in the U.S., if we took all of our acreage that's under production 
currently, and this fluctuates, but they based it on 434 million acres. And we, uh, instead of using industrial chemical practices for farming on that land, and we instead went to um, regenerative, ecological, organic ways of farming, we could reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. by 25 percent. That's Again, an astonishing, stunning figure. I think it's uh, uh, something that we could really, we really need to communicate this to policy leaders on regional level, state level, domestic, and as well as international levels. So. Before I came to Copenhagen, I was in London, and I was really impressed that in London they've been doing a lot of, you know, public art space, concentrating on climate change in this forum that's happening here, the UNFCCC negotiations, etc. And in at the Royal Academy of Arts, they had a major exhibition called Earth, and they had asked major artists, about 20 to 30 artists around the world, to. Um, lend a piece having to do with climate change. And one of the pieces was this poem um, by an artist named Lem Sisse. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it correctly, but it was a video poem, music poem. Is that not working? <laughs> okay. So this was a video, uh, he had, you know, jazz going on and things like that, but I obviously can't do that part. But this is a poem called What If, and it's in response to what if we got it wrong about the whole Darwin survival of the fittest. So here's the poem. What if, let me get it right, what if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves getting strong? What if we found in the ground a vial of proof what if the foundations missed a vital truth? What if the industrial dream sold us out from within? What if our impenetrable defense sealed us in? What if our wanting more was making less? What if all this wasn't progress? Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves getting strong? What if our wanting more was making less? What if this all wasn't progress? What if the disappearing rivers of Etria, the rising tides and encroaching fear, what if the tear inside the protective skin of earth was trying to tell us something? Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves getting strong? What if our message create, carried in the wind was saying something? From butterfly wings to the hurricane, it is the small things that make big change. What if the question towards the end of the le lease is no longer the origin, but the end of the species? Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves getting strong? What if the message carried in the wind was saying something? And I just think that's so apropos to the situation we find ourselves in now vis-a-vis -vis climate ch change and these UNFCCC negotiations. We're being told that the technological solutions for everything, that our industri we can still have industrial growth and, quote, development and carry on with the same hy hyper-economic consumeristic society and still have reductions in climate change. And I think we're finding, and one of the reasons for the stalemate and the failure of these negotiations is that we've been looking to the wrong paradigm for solutions. And we want to bring it back to solutions that really address and recognize people's aspirations and their lives and their livelihoods.